I was at a place where I was just like, wow, this feels really low vibrations. I don't really understand how I'm helping push society forward by selling more sneakers. I started to feel like I was doing meaningless work. But the thing that really pushed me over the edge was I started to hear these stories from how I built this. And I started to realize that people that have become successful in society, some of them started really late or they had $7 million in debt or they had disabilities. And I just realized this is actually a possible thing. I built the idea around this podcast called Claim the Stories. And this little independent podcast went from this passion project to the number one careers podcast globally. Our podcast got featured on different sneaker platforms. It got featured on Apple platforms and other media outlets. Every entrepreneur has to get comfortable working with the unknown. Now you got to figure out how to bring the money in the door. And that's working in ambiguity. I would say it's the top skill set that you're going to need to have. You're flying the plane and you're building the plane all at the same time. That's entrepreneurship. The best advice is not projected advice. You have to be able to decide between what is someone projecting fear on you and what is trying to empower you to navigate what you could possibly encounter. But nine times out of 10, people don't know you're the only one that knows what's best for you. You work in Saucony, you work at Adidas, you work at Nike, um, which are all pretty, you know, major brands, very impressive on the resume and all of that. Um, over the course of your professional career, prior to going freelance, what was your unique skill that you became recognized for in that world. So when your name would come up via headhunter or in an interview, um, what would make people say, Hey, we want Bima at the helm of our, of our marketing. Yeah. I, I mean, w the thing that I've always consistently been is that I've always been at the, at the edge of what's happening. And so, mm -hmm. um, I've always been kind of viewed as a risk taker when when it comes to marketing and it comes to business um if there's something i see that's coming and i feel like we have enough evidence i want to be able to to test out that that theory or test out what's happening um because i know that if we can if we can get it right it'd be such a such a huge opportunity and there were there are multiple instances of that so for example the the way that i even got into um my career path was um social media early on, you're talking 2011, um, it was so new, but I was building community when I was down in Louisiana and I was just having fun. Like there was like this great running community. Um, I was leveraging Facebook and Instagram and blogs to build, to bring that together. And I was also just learning on the fly, right? Just, you know, experimenting, breaking stuff, testing stuff, but, but learning. And what I didn't recognize, you know, cause I'm green, I'm, you know, I'm a kid. I don't, I'm 24. I'm not thinking about titles or brands or anything like that. I'm mostly trying to figure out how I'm going to feed myself. Um, but what, what I recognized was that that was actually innovation that was at the front of the helm of what was happening in, in society. And then when, when it came to commerce and brands and marketing. And so I would start to get sought after for those things. And when I got into these brands, I would always look to see how we can bring new ideas that weren't being, weren't being championed yet to also grow business. And so that's what I truly started to be um, looked at and recruited for was my ability to, from a marketing standpoint, spot an opportunity. How can we commercialize this opportunity um, and also then spread it across if we had a bigger global business, spread it across the rest of the business. And so I was just really, um, really at the front end of like what was happening and bringing that into the system and trying to figure out how we can, how we can leverage it. So that's what folks started to, to come to me for was, was truly my marketing acumen and being at the edge of trying new things when it came to, to, to marketing. What's a, what's a couple of examples for people who don't know your work, like that would come yeah. up maybe in an interview of, of something you did that helped, that was, that was uh, a foreshadowing of what was coming? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things that happened when I was over at Sockety was it was 2015 and the, uh, the sneaker industry was changing. Mm -hmm. And essentially what that meant was that um, brands were now going after these really big celebrities to create product with 
and also do so in a lifestyle standpoint. Previously, it was it was really a, all about athlete, and then they would collaborate with some of these smaller niche brands. But now you're taking that model and you're putting it on like celebrity creatives. And so Jordan had just signed Drake, and we knew things were about to change in in that regard. Adidas had signed Kanye, and Puma had signed Rihanna. Now Saucony was a much smaller brand. The total business at the time was around 300 million. And, and then the lifestyle business was around 37 million growing towards 50 million. And just to give an example of like the size of these other brands, you know, at the time, I think Adidas was like 10 billion and I think Nike was somewhere in like the 20 billion, 25 billion range. So significantly bigger, got way more, way more money to spend. So I was like, hey, we can't compete in that regard. But what we can do is we can look for communities that are strong, united, and foster those communities um, and build a different way, right? You don't want to take the same playbook that, that someone else is, is using. You're not going to win with someone else's playbook. And so what, what we decided to do was we had identified that that, and, and this has been one of my, my strong shoots till to this day, is just digital approach. And what we realized was there, there were creators and influencers that were talking about um, Saucony at the time uh, without Saucony having to do anything. They were just genuinely fans of it. And at that point, no one had, from a brand standpoint, had directly engaged with the digital community and said, hey, you know, can we collaborate with you? Can we collaborate with you on sneakers? Can we collaborate with you on content? Can we collaborate with you to build community and events? And because I didn't have a lot of really guardrails or boundaries, it was just me really like leading that front for the business. I started to put together this program where we would take 10 different creatives and influencers that were based on YouTube. They already had their own audiences and we would partner with them to create um, their own sneakers and create their own campaigns and bring them to life. And then, um, and then we would sell them on, on Saucony.com with them. And that resulted in helping us grow our Instagram organically from 3,000 to 80,000 followers within a year. And then we we sold out of all the product in, within 10 minutes. Um, and then what you started to see was the rest of the industry started to do that. <laughs> the rest wow. of the industry started to partner with the with different influencers and, and creatives um, in that way. But we were early on um, there. The only thing that we didn't have was we didn't have the the full marketing support to make sure it was known that we had done that. So it was it was known to those who knew. But it wasn't, I would say it wasn't widely known to the to the rest of the industry. And so that's that's one of the examples of 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 how, you know, I was able to do that. And then, you know, another example was working with a, a team of incredible folks when I was at Adidas. Um, I worked on this project uh, where we brought in Donald Glover and what we, <laughs> we we were working on this project with him. And what was so great about Donald, he's an incredible storyteller. And so you knew that he was going to bring that into this partnership and, and this collaboration. And he told these stories with Monique. And it was at a time where um, Monique, the comedian, that a lot of folks uh, didn't recognize like the genius of, of Monique. But Donald Glover definitely did. He's a student of culture, a student of his craft. And so these short films that came out are like him and, and Monique. And she's kind of like, you know, if you remember like the Jordan ads where Spike Lee was mm -hmm. with Michael Jordan, Monique was kind of like uh, the Spike to, <laughs> to, 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 um, to Donald's MJ. And it was such a beautiful dynamic. But what was also really dope was um, we'd worked with this, this, this agency and the comms team. And they came up with this campaign where um, at Coachella, it was 2019 April Coachella, there was an airdrop, you know, there's an airdrop feature. And so they would airdrop people like, hey, you just got a free pair of Donald Glover, Adidas sneakers, come pick them up here. And so, you know, I just always love being a part of those fringe ex experiences that can then be taken by the brand and commercialized if they want to do it in, in bigger efforts. But those are some of the examples of some of the moments that I've, I've been proud to be a part of. Um, and then, you know, brought into my own freelance experience. 
Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. And you said you said you started to feel a bit of an emptiness inside. Mm. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, for people who may be in a similar situation, what does that feel like actually? <laughs> like coming to going to work, coming home from work, the way you relate to work, like how does that actually feel? Yeah. I mean, it's, I think the first thing is it's, 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 I wasn't motivated as, as I, or inspired is perhaps the word um, that I thought I would be. And it was because I couldn't really understand um, what was the point of what I was doing beyond the commerce. Mm -hmm. um, what was the what was the humanity? Where was the humanity in what I was I was doing, and and how that related to society? And you know, it came at a point where I would say it really was head head on was in 2016, and that was the year that um, that Trump got elected and it wasn't so much about that it was so much about that things in society came polarizing and divisive and there were people that looked like me that didn't have opportunities you know what i mean like i was working in a space where um i was the only person that looked like me out of 400 people and I was like, oh, this is strange. Or you look outside in the entrepreneurial landscape and you're like, there, where are, you know, the, where are the diverse opportunity of businesses? I know we have these incredible ideas, but where, like, where are we in this, in this landscape of things? And so I really started to feel like selling more sneakers, just selling more sneakers. I don't really understand how I'm helping push society um forward <laughs> you know what i mean i felt i started to feel um i started to feel like i was doing meaningless work because i wasn't i was getting uh to a degree i was getting you know compensation but i would never get the compensation um of the true value that i was bringing to the table just because of how i was set up right um, and then, you know, how can I then help, you know, my community if I can't even, you know, I can't even get any of these things to do so. Um, and so I was at a place where I was just like, wow, this feels really, really, really low vibrations was not high vibrations at all. And were you reading something? Did you watch a movie that kind of planted this seed of purpose around your work? Would you be listening to something? Did you have mentors that you would talk to about this? Like, how, how did you, how did this sort of crystallize in your awareness? Yeah. So I would say it started with like conversations with just with other colleagues mm -hmm. where, you know, we would kind of begin having conversations about ideas and things that we wanted to do and things that we weren't able to do. Um, and so that was a part of the conversation, but there was really, um, and then just seeing other people do things. And so one of the things that I really had started to do was I, I continued to try to pour into myself. And so I would try to go to panels and events and just start just hearing people's stories that were, were successful from an entrepreneurial standpoint, but also connected back to that they were actually improving something in their community or society. And um, there were different folks that, that really kind of touched me at that point. Um, there was this, this woman named Danielle Leslie and she had, you know, created this, um, this digital course where she was helping folks figure out how to unlock their, their, their skill sets and their experience and, and monetize them. And what I thought was so dope about that was essentially that's a, a book, but she's showing people how to turn it into a course and she's showing them how to, to create additional income, um, for themselves. And then you see how she's been able to, to impact her community. So I thought that was super dope. There was a book I came across called Morning Mindset, and he spoke so much about um, getting clear clarity and taking time out for yourself and not just going into your day. And so I was starting to do some of those things. Um, but the thing that really pushed me over the edge to really do something about what was happening with myself um, 
was I was largely inspired by how I built this. And it was because I started to hear these stories from Guy Raz and from these, these entrepreneurs. And I started to realize that I used to grow up thinking that like, if it wasn't a perfect scenario, then um, these things weren't able to be accomplished, right? I used to just think like, oh, these folks folk must have came from this or this must have been the case. And there is a lot of that. But I didn't realize how many people um, that have become, you know, um, quote unquote successful in society, some of them started really late or some of them started and they had like $7 million in debt or mm -hmm. they had disabilities. And like, I just, you know, didn't realize I was like, oh, this is not impossible. <laughs> Like this is, this is actually a possible thing. And so through that, I experienced that. But the push for me was Adidas had gone through this, this, this um, moment where this article came out and essentially it said that they were stifling, intentionally stifling the careers of, of black professionals like me. And I was like, whoa. And I was like, I felt resistance, but I didn't know it was like systemic and like, lo and behold, you know, all this information will come out and, and that would be the case. And it inspired me to say, hey, maybe this is an opportunity for me to just try something that's for me and my community, because I'd spent so much time. And I think you find a lot of creatives that work within uh, corporate organizations, right? We're like, oh, how can I lead the brand to this way to, to help this community, but it also will help its business. And you spend so many time, so much time trying to convince people that aren't from that community that this is good for business. You know what I mean? And so it's like, this feels like I'm just smashing my head against the wall. But what happens if I just try to try it, you know, outside of this system? And that's what I started to do. Um, and it started to to gain traction. But it came from all of those things and all those feelings and all those experiences. But it was hard because I didn't know a lot of people that were doing entrepreneurial things. <laughs> mm -hmm. And before you saw that David Letterman show, mm. Obama and Jay-Z, had you fancied yourself as an interviewer or did that, did something about that show ignite that desire within you? I'm a, I'm a, I, I like to, to visualize. I would say I'm a, I'm a visionary in that, in that, in that regard. And so I'll see everything here. Um, mm -hmm. and I can envision myself in it and I can envision other people in it. And, and that was, you know, my, my strength as a, as a marketer is like, I could build the play, as I say, like I can, I could build the heck out of the play. I just wasn't accustomed to being in front of the play. Didn't want to be front facing of the, of the thing. Um, and, and that's where my, my imposter syndrome lied the most. There is this identity um, that I had connected to, which was that, um, oh, no, I can't do that, right? Like, um, that's, not, that's not what I'm meant to do. And I would start to have instances where I would be proven wrong about, about that, that thing, that identity that I built up so much. In, in myself, but I never for a long time, when I was building, I built the idea to start interviewing and the concept around this podcast called Claim of Stories, I had an idea that someone else would be the host and I would be a producer. Mm. I would just be the marketer behind the scenes. And what you realize is that when you build something, I don't care if you're you're like, you have plans to to build a doghouse outside or you have plans to cook a meal you realize that if you're the one who took the time to really come up with this, this idea, no one else is going to really know what to do with it <laughs> um, as much as you will, right? You will know the creative things that you need to adjust to really get it right. And so you have to be actively involved. And so when I thought about that from the, the interview standpoint, this is where childhood things started to creep in that I started to realize I was telling myself that wasn't true. And so what wasn't true was that I can't communicate. I can't speak in front of other people. I can't, I can't, I can't. But I spent my whole life observing my dad being the most social person in my entire life. And he just easily struck up conversations with other humans. That's something I observed my whole life that he was around. And so, of course, I didn't realize that that was something that was sitting very naturally for me. And so mm. my first interviews were on a live stage 
in front of my peers and I never interviewed anyone before. But this is where what you observe and your talent comes into play. It felt very natural to me because that's what I've been doing my whole life. I was so used to being an introvert, asking people questions, getting them to talk, fostering the conversation. I didn't even think twice about what I was doing. And then I realized, oh, this is this is a thing. I can do this. I could do this at a very high level and I could do it at a level without feeling like I'm expensing a lot of energy. You know what I mean? Like it just felt like, oh, this was meant for me. <laughs> and I realized like what it unlocked for other people and how I was able to disarm other people to to open up to me in ways that a lot of times they don't even open up to their family. And and I didn't I didn't know that was something that I was capable of until I sat down that day to do that thing. And only until then did I then have the the thought of like Oh yeah, that David Letterman style show. Um, I would love to to experience something like that someday. Um, just more so me now being at a place where I just want to push myself um, as far as I can go. I want to know how far I can go. You know, kind of like when I as, as I run, like the first time I did a marathon, I was like, oh, I can run twenty six miles. <laughs> so, so that's where it came from for me. <laughs> And uh, so I want you to just give us a montage of those next couple of years. You're now dedicating Saturdays to interviewing. Mm -hmm. You make that post on LinkedIn. You connect mm -hmm. with Trevor mm -hmm. and just talk about the, the, the transition process. Cause now you're in this relationship with your work where you're basically checked out in terms yeah. of your heart. Yeah. You're still showing up and you have a plan. I'm going to run away from this thing to the north to follow the north star you're gonna follow my heart Chief. <laughs> how did you prepare what did you feel like you needed in place in terms of because you have a wife you know you can't just mm -hmm. be out here you know <laughs> playing loosey goosey with the finances <laughs> you know what i mean facts facts i think well, you know one of the things i would say is that everyone everyone is going to think everyone in your current circle is going to to take it with a grain of salt and it's because it's not common for people to actually be in a career, be in a career that is a desirable, considered dream job um, to to say, actually, I'm going to leave this. I'm going to start this thing that I don't know if it's going to work. And yeah. so all the your cautionary folks, tales, man, my oh, friend did you know, that. Those, he had to go yeah, back and yeah, work at the gas station. Go back, you know, he had to go back with his head down. You know, his family was was out in the street, you know, like all the stories. <laughs> and um and so first thing was for me first, I had to check in with me first and I had to had to really get clear on why am I why am I doing this? And the reason I had to get clear on that why is because I knew that it was going to get hard. It was going to be stuff I was going to encounter that I didn't know. And if I didn't have a good why, it was it was going to fall apart. It wasn't it wasn't something I was going to be able to stick with. Um, it wasn't something I because it was something I hadn't identified was bigger than me, but I had now identified that, yo, this is, this is bigger than me. And, and so some of those first steps was like, I remember telling my, one of my closest friends at work and one of my very best friends now, uh, my friend said, and he, I was like, Hey, I got this idea. It's called Clayma. And he was like, Oh yeah, that's, that's fire, bro. And it was, that, but that's was everybody because everybody's dreamer. Everybody has concepts. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I started to do the work, right? And so I still have my nine to five. I'm not crazy. Like I got a, I got a mortgage that I got to pay for. I got a partner. She's also an entrepreneur. And so like, you know, I had to be like, not only had I had to make money while I was building the thing. And so most people, when you, when you say this, it starts, most people are like, oh, I would never do that. But when you're like, when you're basically possessed about building something, you do whatever you have to. So I'm up at 6 a.m., I do some work on Clayma before then. I would go to work. Lunchtime, I would do some work on Clayma. I would finish out my work day. And then evening, I would do work on Clayma. And so I would, I would not go to certain things. I wouldn't be going out during the week. Um, there were social activations that I would miss. There was limited amounts of sleep that I was getting because I was just trying to figure out and, and, and really build this thing because I didn't want to feel like I'd felt when I was working at at Adidas at that point. I was like, this cannot be how 
my my corporate experience and my life is is going to go. And so then, you know, from there, I would partner with different folks. I would have like um, I would have uh, focus groups where I bring together different creatives and I start sharing them the ideas that I was working on just to get responses, just to get feedback. Right. I got to a place where I was like, if this is going to work, I got to get past my ego. You know, I cannot have a fragile ego. Folks have got to be able to, to share different perspectives and I've got to be able to absorb that information and figure out how to put it to use. And so I would do that. And I do that on Saturdays. Um, a lot of my Saturdays became like also work days. Um, and then from there, you know, the idea was like, OK, let's see if we can pilot this. And, and so from there, I said, I got this idea, I have this concept. Um, I need to find a place to like get a working example of like showing me doing this. And so other people can be like, OK, we like this concept. Here's where we change it, adjust it. I have one, so I, one, oh, yeah, yeah. one question um, before we get to this next part. You're in a marriage. Yes. So Saturdays, you know, your wife is like, hey, you know, you worked all week. You, now it's our time together. Did you all have to have a commitment? Did mm -hmm. you have to get her on the same page? Did she mm -hmm. sign off? I know she's an entrepreneur, too. So she had her own thing. Maybe she was busy doing her own thing. But just talk a little bit about that for those people who are in a relationship who may want to present a different paradigm to their partner, how do you enroll them in that? Yeah, so that's a conversation. And if you are, if you're an entrepreneur, your house is entrepreneurs too. It's, you can't do it without the support of your household, but also then your friends are also entrepreneurs too. You cannot do it by yourself and you can't do it in secret. It's gonna crush you because you need the help. And so one of the first conversations when I was doing this was, well, you know, I had a little bit of a, a better conversation because Caitlin was an entrepreneur. So she understood the basics of like wanting to chase this thing that you're passionate about. And no work life balance for a little while. No work life balance. And we don't we actually don't believe in work life balance. We believe in harmony. Right. You got to design it um, in order to work for you. And so for us, you know. We have like days and times where we do certain things. It's like, you know, OK, we're going to go run together at, at 7 a.m. or we're going to pull up to have lunch together on Thursday or date night is going to be on, you know, Friday or something like that. And, and, and that's how we're going to spend spend our time. And then like, you know, every quarter, this is our weekend. No phones, no business talk. Like, let's go enjoy ourselves. And so mm -hmm. we got to a place in our conversation where it's like every day we're not going to have. We won't have certain time, but, you know, we will make sure we have things and time blocks blocked off where it is about us. It's not about business or, or those things. And so she was really a great partner in, in that regard of like, hey, yeah, as long as we figure out how to pay the bills, figure it out. Right. And, you know, I would go support her when she was, you know, doing farmers markets. Now she's got shops. And, and and vice versa, you know, when I was doing interviews, she was coming there bringing lunch. She was helping set up. She was, you know, helping build desks when we got our office, you know, all this stuff. So you have to be a part of each other's um, ecosystem, if you will, because if you're off building something um, and 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 they're not a part of it, you also can start to grow apart because you got this whole world. That is just like, well, how am I, you know, how am I a part of that world? How do, how do I integrate into that world? And that's work you have to constantly do. You have to figure out how to make space for other people, especially important people in your life, to be a part of that work. Um, and that's just something I just, I, I'm very passionate about, but that's what we do, right? We just have to have those open dialogues about what that looks like. And sometimes, again, like some folks really value a certain way that they they live but you know for us we do too and and we were able to plan opportunities where we still go on vacations and but we use them as like celebratory moments we're like we hit this goal we're going on this trip we're going to mexico we're going to mexico city <laughs> i like that all right so you were telling me about the preparation to take the leap of faith yes 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 so um so yeah so again then you you know we started doing the interviews the interview caught and from there, we started to get feedback from people and they were like, are you going to do a podcast? Where can I get more of these conversations, et cetera? And so what I needed to figure out, because um, one of the things a friend had always said to me is like, don't leave before, don't leave before you got something to pay the bills. 
Runway. And I was like, yeah, you got to have some runway. And it's the way I kind of I coach people today. I spend a lot of time coaching creatives on uh, their freelance experience. And what I say is like, have a nine to five so you don't have to stress as you're creating this new thing. And that's exactly what, what we did. And so we took our example and I went to a client um, that had a need. And I said, hey, we do this. Do you think you could be a sponsor? I think this is these are the ways that's going to benefit what it is that you do. It was Portland State University. They were trying to get more of their students into the sneaker industry. Um, I said, hey, we can actually bring this sneaker industry to you. We can educate and we also facilitate relationships. Super simple. And that's what we did. So we bring interview folks in there. We interview them and they would have time with the students. Students could ask questions, et cetera. It's like one of the best case studies, I think, for the university. So that also allowed us to get our first bucket of content out mm -hmm. into the world. And little did I know, we were about to go through one of the biggest um, global crises in the world. That 2019, we started filming, but 2020, we all know we got stuck inside. And that's when podcasting and content really just exploded beyond what it already was. And we, our podcast got featured on different sneaker platforms. It got featured on Apple platforms and other media outlets. And this little independent podcast went from this passion project to the number one global careers podcast um, globally. Um, and so it was through that, it attracted the right types of clients where I could then make the decision that, oh, I think I'm going to step away now. And that was a bigger conversation I had to have um, with, with, with my partner, with Caitlin, because that was, you know, income, you know, when I was working Nike, that was income that we knew was coming in the door. And now you're heading towards a place where, yes, you got contracts in place, but it is a bit more like this is your own business. Now you got to figure out how to bring the money in the door. And um, it's, it's, you know, that's working in ambiguity. Every entrepreneur has to get comfortable working with the unknown. It's, it is the, uh, I would say it's the top skill set that you're going to need to have because you got to hustle, especially when you don't know, like you're flying the plane and you're building the plane all at the same time. That's entrepreneurship. And that's essentially what I was deciding to do. Um, but 2020 June, in the middle of this pandemic, in the middle of uh, civil unrest, I decided to resign from my dream job because I was at Nike at that point. And I decided I was going to become full-time freelance, um, creative, building my podcast and building my career as a personality. Hmm. You um, asked for help on LinkedIn. And I feel like there are people who ask for help and there's crickets. And there are people who ask for help and then people are like clamoring to help. What are the, What's the difference? How do you actually generate genuine interest in someone who wants to help you? And then how, how did you develop that patience? Cause it took a couple of years for that help to really come through in the way that, that, um, that you wanted. Yeah. It has to be something that people were passionate about, right? If, if, they, if it's not something that they're passionate about, typically it's going to be very hard to get folks to, to show up and, and to help. One of the things that I find that folks really start to show up to help you is one after there's traction that starts to exist and they see like, oh, this is actually something real. But two, they see that you're committed to it because a lot mm -hmm. of times people start something and then they just, you know, it goes away. So people don't really want to go out their way to help when they if in the back of their mind, they think it's just a phase that you're going. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I would say is when they also see beyond just consistency, they also see your level of commitment. The reason that I believe um, that LinkedIn post got so much response was because during a global pandemic, during civil unrest, folks saw that I had left something that I was clearly very passionate about to go pursue something that I felt was, was bigger than me. And, and folks were like, I want to help you figure this out. Cause I also was very honest and transparent in that. Like I got the vision for this. I don't know all the things that I need to do. 
to, to, to figure this out. I'm going to need some help. Um, and it was at a place in time in society where I think we were all just like realizing like, damn, I thought we were way further along. I thought we were, <laughs> I thought we were better than where we actually are. <laughs> and we, we came to realize like, we're not. <laughs> and so I think other folks were just like, well, I'm not going to make the same decision that you made, Bima, but I want to help you. I want to make sure that you can to you can have an impact and you can get where you're going. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it was a lot of those things that contributed to um, why folks. But then the other thing is how it's structured. I'm also very I'm very big on how you communicate things in a in a way that um, connects with people immediately and then also um, invites them to, to help. Right. And so typically, if there's something like that, that I would I would post or I would share, I always start with the the big thing that's going to get someone's attention. And at the time, what I knew was going to get some folks attention was that this dude quit his job to help black and brown creatives. That's going to get your attention in 2020. And then from there, I started to explain exactly what the problem was, what I was trying to solve, and then how I wanted folks to help. A lot of times we're not specific enough to, to say what we need help with, or we're also shy about asking what we need help with. And I had to get to a place with myself because, you know, a lot of creatives will say it feels salesy or I feel like a slimy salesperson. Mm -hmm. And what I have to say is like, if, if you're trying to get over the, the mountain, right? And the thing that's going to stop you from getting over the mountain is asking that question. But you got to get over the mountain to survive. Are you willing? Are you willing to die because you're not willing to ask the question to get over the mountain? Right. And that's the way I started to approach myself. I said, dude, if you don't ask this thing, I don't care how you how you how you're feeling about it. You got to you have to solve that with yourself. But regardless of how you're feeling, where you're feeling good, bad, mediocre, if you don't ask this question, you're not going to be able to accomplish this thing that you said that you set out to do. So you have to get com not get comfortable. You have to just acknowledge how you feel and move forward anyway. And that's what I started to do. And I started to realize that um, I'm all it always goes back to running. I'm never going to always feel great about <laughs> or comfortable with some of the things I, I have to do. It's going to push me outside of my comfort zone. And usually when I'm outside of my comfort zone, not usually, always when I'm outside of my comfort zone is where I encounter success or growth. Yeah, it's interesting, man, the, the juxtaposition of, you know, wanting to really step into this new identity or role. And obviously there's some imposter syndrome that comes with that, but then also trying to sort of weave in some humility mm. and some vulnerability, which I think in today's culture is what can move the needle, is what can get traction, is what can inspire people more so than maybe in our parents' era or our grandparents' era where you had to kind of you know, have this more stoic approach mm -hmm. to just sort of forcing your way up that mountain, whether yeah. hell or come, come hell or high water. <laughs> um, so you mentioned civil unrest a couple of times. And I think mm. this, this is something that a lot of creators struggle with. And I'm speaking about my own experience as well. We live in a society where shit happens and you're mm. like, oh man, I thought we were past this, right? Mm. And I'm, I'm like thinking about, okay, what's my next meditation related post going to be? But now I have mm -hmm. to weave in fucking police brutality with yeah. meditation. <laughs> yeah. And like, well, how much of this do I want to do? Is this going to yeah. distract from my main message? I don't really, like, I'm concerned, but I'm not, I'm not willing to die on this. I don't want to mm. dedicate my whole feed to this issue right. that's come up. So what was that conversation like with you talking about marketing and helping black and brown people in that way? and civil unrest and obviously it applies to other things like maybe it applies to what's happening in the middle east right now like how do you know how much of your feed to devote to those kinds of issues if any right right so here's the here's the first thing that i decided a long time ago i decided a long time ago that i i recognize that um the moment i decided to step into the world that i was going to step into that i was going to be a public figure and that I wasn't going to become a public figure that was going to dance around what um, what I believed in. And I thought from day one, I said, I don't want to be one of those people that, you know, people carry pick pitchforks behind because 
they found out that they were something different than what they had presented themselves with because they wanted to ride the middle line because they were afraid of like losing folks followers. and losing audience, losing followers. And I just made it, you know, the decision that I'm going to serve one audience and I'm going to serve that audience as best as I can. Um, and I'm, I'm totally okay with that. And but what it did for me, it gave me a sense of relief because I watch brands do this all day. They try to talk to everybody and, and that's how everybody gets caught up. Because when you try to talk to everybody, we don't know what you stand for. Therefore, you don't stand for anything. And so I knew that from, from day one, I was going to stand for, for something. The other reason, uh, the other thing that I knew was that, you know, I'm a black man living in America. I, I know what that experience like. I know what that experience like is for, for other black men and other folks that are in the black community. And I know that um, oftentimes we are only viewed a certain way. And so I said, I'm going to double down on that. And the main thing, though, that I'm here to solve is that I'm here to help creatives figure out how to accomplish their dreams, whether they want to become creative entrepreneurs or they just want to get a project off the ground. So I always said that my main topic day one is going to be that. But there are times where there are things that happen that my community looks to me as as a voice for things they might not be able to share because they may work in an environment where if they shared that, they would get, you know, they would get blackballed behind the scenes, right? And so I recognize that they they look for me to share some of these sentiments um, that they might not be at a space where they can share those things. And so if there's something happening and I'm like, I have to speak on it, um, I've cultivated my brand in that way where that's what I'm going to do because the, the community that I'm here to serve, they need that information. They need that to be shared. And so they don't expect me to be, um, you know, a, po po a political activist, but they do expect me to be aware of what's happening and also to, to share it when they're voicing it to me, when they're lighting me up in my DMs and they're saying like, yo, this is going on. Can you please, you know, bring a conversation to this? And then I'm like, yeah, absolutely. You know? Um, but there's also circumstances where I'm like, because I know that my main thing is to, to talk about the marketing um, with creators from a cultural sense, right? Um, I can't talk about every day, everything that, that's happening. And so for me, I do do a balance of like, you know, this is the main thing, but if like something crazy starts to happen, like I will make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to it. And it's a bit more artful, right? It's like, I can't, I don't have like a scientific of like, I do seven posts a week and one of them is going to be about this, right? No, it's, it's more of an artful approach for me. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, speaking of artful approaches, you had this podcast, are you, is it pod, is, is, uh, claim a podcast still happening? Yeah. So, um, we have four seasons okay. and, uh, the fourth season is actually going to be the last season mm. of the podcast. Uh, we wrapped it up with amazing conversations with, um, Ravy B and, um, gosh, Christian, Chris and Beffy Gibbs, so many amazing conversations, but, you know, due to, uh, you know, I had a post in December, um, about this and I actually haven't, haven't said this publicly yet, but, you know, brands had committed to working with, um, black and brown creatives, billion, a billion in commitments to invest in in this work. And so when we built the show, it was a built around those commitments that would, would come in. Um, and so once those things started to not materialize, um, we decided to, to pivot. Um, mm -hmm. And so there were some opportunities on the table to bring it to different um, media platforms and organizations. But at this point in time, we've decided that, you know, season four is going to be the end could, could potentially, I don't know, come back years from now, but but for now, um, I think we're gonna we're gonna hold off and we're gonna focus efforts on different different places. But there's over a hundred episodes of really incredible conversations there. When you say we've decided, are you talking about you? <laughs> no, you well, no. Like I have a whole, you know, I I have a co-founder that I work with on that project, mm -hmm. and I had um, I had like a team of seven people that worked mm -hmm. on that show um, mm -hmm. with me because we would travel to record. Um, I would have an editorial team where we're going back and forth on, you know, the shape of the conversations. I had a, a producer and a, um, a operations manager. And so it was, you know, when I say we, it was like, you know, it was a lot of folks, but obviously I'm like the, 
I'm the biggest guarantee. I'm the guarantee. It's my, you know, it's, it's on me financially. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's why. But I say we in that regard. <laughs> and when you're interviewing people about their careers versus interviewing celebrities like Tyler, mm-hmm. the creator, or like mm-hmm. John Baptiste, what's, what's the, are there any differences in the preparation or the approach? Yeah. I, when you're, when you're interviewing someone personally, um, that's not a celebrity. They're not as guarded. Mm-hmm. And, um, but also there's not as much information about them that's out there. And so there's a lot more work that we do to try to get information. But the thing that we get to do that I love is like, we get to do a proper pre-interview, mm. um, where we get to just get an understanding of where they are and talk to some other people that are in their life about, you know, what's going on in their world and what's, what's, um, important. Whereas when I'm speaking to celebrities, we don't really have the ability to always do a pre-interview. A lot of times it's us meeting for the first time on camera and I have to do a lot of work to get them to trust me. In, in, in what's, your, what's your go-to technique for, for that, to get, to open them up, you know, and get them to uh, play along with, with your interview style? Southern charm. <laughs> <laughs> Southern hospitality. Um, what, what I realize is that you don't realize how, how often people don't encounter kindness in their mm. day to day, in their business. And a lot of times what they encounter is just business, not personal. And so I make it a point to be personal with folks. I make it a point to, um, to, to actually be a student of what it is that they do. It's kind of like what, what you did with me earlier on. You know, you, you asked me about, you know, the personal aspects of, of where I'm at today. And what I find is when you take the time to try to get the person, get to know the person beyond what you've seen on social media, they feel like, oh, I can rest. I don't have to necessarily be the thing right now. <laughs> I can just be me, the human right now. Um, and, you know, with, with, with media in general, every folks have a different, you know, a bit of a mistrust um, with it mm-hmm. um, or folks feel like they go on certain platforms and, and the edit doesn't represent them in a way that they, they feel like they, they're represented. And so I'm, I'm also very transparent. I also tell people from the very beginning, I was like, this is what I'm trying to accomplish with this. And this is, you know, I usually tell folks if I'm doing that career kind of oriented story, I'm like, we're talking to your 16 year old self. Mm-hmm. And with your 16 year old self, I want you to be very honest about, the different things that you you navigate it because I don't know. I'm 16. I don't know that yet. So if you could take the time to break that down for me so that, you know, I'm still going to mess up, still going to fuck some stuff up. But if you could still like give me like a, a purview to what I might encounter, right, um, that interview is going to be way more um, impactful to mm-hmm. me, right? It's going to give you more back for the time that we just spent together versus you just coming on, giving surface level information. So that's that's one of the ways that I I, I tend to try to approach it in, in in different ways. But everyone I do try to tell them about the if I remember, because sometimes I get just so hyped up. Um, I do try to remember to tell them like, hey, can you approach this as if you're if you're speaking to your 16 year old self? Because I remember when I was 16, lost, didn't know anything, you know, lacked the confidence and and lacked the the belief in myself. Um, and I would carry that through for years. And I think all of us experience it at, at another point in time um, where it's not just it doesn't completely we don't completely overcome it, but we manage it. Right. Because there's some some days where you feel like I got it. And then there's some days you feel like what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that framework. I'm actually going to use that um, <laughs> moving forward because it's, it's just very specific, you know, like it is. Yeah. We've all been at that place. Yeah. Where you're dreaming, but you're not quite sure how to, how that dream is going to come together and, um, you have no and what idea. roadblocks are going to be, you're going to have to face. But also, you know, again, without, you don't want to be that person who's bringing all the cautionary tales to <laughs> the story. You know, you want to be that because there's a, look, it's not that it's not there. The world is full of those people. You don't have to do that when you're saying, oh, be careful and, and it's going to be hard. There's a thousand people saying that you want to be yeah. the person. I saw this clip of Andre 3000, you know, talking about how one of his best friends tried to convince him not to release. Hey, yeah. 
you know, back <laughs> came out. He's like, man, if you release this, this is going to kill your career. <laughs> and and he's telling that story um, in anticipation of the flute album coming out. Yes. And he still remembers that conversation, you know? Yeah. And so you don't want to be that person remembered for that reason. You're the one that tried to talk me out of doing the biggest thing that I've ever experienced in my career. <laughs> well, that's one of the things that you learn. And I'm sure you learn this as well. Um, you're the only one that knows what's best for you. Other mm -hmm. people are going to give you advice and guidance. And some of that advice will be good. Um, the, the best advice is not um, pro projected advice, right? You have to be able to decide to, to decide between what is someone projecting fear on you and what is just like um, trying to give you um, to empower you to navigate what you're going to encounter or, or what you could possibly encounter. But, you know, nine times out of 10, people don't know what's best for you. They're not you. They don't have all of the insights and details that you have. And so you got to go out. You got to go put your hand on the stove, on that hot stove. You got to burn it. <laughs> you know, you got to know what to do after you burn it. Uh, that's the only way we learn. We learn by doing. We do not learn by people telling us what to avoid. We, yeah. you know, and, and some people figure it out for themselves and they push harder and further. You know, the, the story about, uh, what was it? Um, was it Henry Ford and, and the horses? And people are like, mm -hmm. if, if we would have listened to people, we just had faster horses. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's one of those things. People always say it's not possible, but it was probably not possible for them. But it doesn't mean it's not possible for you. Things have changed. Technology has changed. Who knows what's possible now? You don't know until you try. Yeah, the best, the, the, the question that I go to when someone comes to me and, um, and asks for advice is just, what is your heart telling you to do? You know, I could give them technically proficient advice if that's what they're looking for. Do this first, do this second, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, if your heart's telling you to do, the, to do this certain thing or to go in this, this direction, you have to do it. Cause it's not yeah. going to go away. You can try to, you can try to drown it out with alcohol, with weed, with distractions, but it's not going to go away in your quietest moments and the darkest hours of the night. It's not going to go away until you take a step in that direction. It's going to follow you. You have to, you have to address it. You have mm -hmm. to address it somehow, some way it doesn't, everything that we don't deal with, it just follows us and it keeps showing up. You grew up in Louisiana, right? Yeah, I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's about 45 minutes um, west mm. of New Orleans or mm. New Orleans or Nova. <laughs> and your parents worked at a chemical plant. I'm not sure what right. that means exactly, but I know they didn't want you to work at a chemical plant. They wanted you right. to have a different type of life. So just so talk, about, yeah, talk about like growing up and, and what their sort of philosophy was for you mm. and, and what your idea of success looked like as, you, as a young person. Totally. So like, you know, the chemical plant situation is like just picture walking through a building and they're like in the building are like these pipes and in these pipes are are acids that if that pipe cracked and that chemical fell on someone, it would completely go and erode through their skin. It would it would, you know, um, dissolve their bone. Like you're talking about extremely dangerous materials that that folks are working in and also um, potentially cancerous um, chemicals as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my folks grew up in, in Louisiana or Louisiana. And uh, for, for them, you know, especially my mom um, was more so like, you know, I want a better opportunity. But more specifically, like you're going to go to school, <laughs> you're going to go to college. You're going to get a degree and you're going to get a job where you don't have to work near these things. And my father, um, you know, I think don't get me wrong. My mother is very creative, but uh, my father led with his creative um, as far as like how he want, what he wanted to be and things he wanted to accomplish. And so his his kind of approach was more so like, I just want you to be happy. Like what you know, what 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 can you do that's going to allow you to be happy? And so I had. When they separated, they separated when I was or divorced when I was nine. And I just remember um, there wasn't so much space for like a serious pursuit from a creative standpoint. Um, it was very like um, go down the traditional path, like 
get these things done. But also for me, like being protective of my mom, not wanting to disappoint my mom. Um, you know, I felt like there was so much that I didn't embrace creatively um, or even experimenting wise just because I, I didn't want to didn't want to disappoint. And like, you know, things weren't like, you know, a lot of my friends had still had parents that were together. And, um, you know, my my kind of childhood felt I was also an only child. And so there were a lot of aspects of my life that felt kind of lonely, if that makes sense. Yeah. What was your archetype in school? Were you the the creative kid? Were you the athlete? Were you the nerd? Were you the ladies man? <laughs> I was the introverted athlete um, that was a distance runner. So when you wow. think of athletes, right? Skinny. You think like, yes, yeah, skinny, wasn't the basketball player, wasn't the football player. Um, but I was this skinny, introverted kid that always smiled a lot. And, but I also always loved like sneakers. And so, um, people would always, um, people would always take notice of like what sneakers or clothes or something like that, that I had on. And then, um, you know, I always fell in love with, um, the opportunities to, to run and be connected with my teammates. And, and as a runner, you know, I wasn't a, I wasn't a sprinter. I was a, a distance runner. And that was also different because most of the, um, the, the black athletes and runners were, were sprinters, but was, what was unique, um, for me and, and, and the, the, the team that I was on was so many of my teammates were black distance runners. And so, you know, we look like a team of Kenyans, which was, which was, which was a dope experience for, for me. And it's something I carry with me to this day, but I was, I was pretty shy. Like I was a pretty shy kid. Mm -hmm. Did you win anything? Any meets? Yeah, I, um, I was pretty competitive. I would, I would say I was in the, I was One in the top 10%. Um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't win state. I won regionals. Um, when we got to state, there was just this kid, I, you know, I ran an 800, um, in, in track. And there was just this kid that he was running 151 and I was running 159. Right. So it was like, it was great to like break two minutes in, in the, in the, in the 800 meter. But like when you come across kids running like nine seconds, faster that's a lot in, in high lot. school, that is really fast. And now that event is a sprint. Right. But so, you know, but I love like, you know, relays, like I was, you know, one of the things that I, I, a mindset that I've de developed now that I didn't have then was I didn't really have a sense of urgency then. I didn't really have so much of a competitive background or desire then. I didn't have a why, didn't have a purpose. And so I, I was resting more on my natural ability to run. Yes, I went to practice and all those things, but I wasn't necessarily pushing myself past the place of discomfort. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and all those things. And I wasn't also wasn't pushed in, in my household. The only place that it was pushed was, was, you know, with my coach. Um, and you know, he, he was just like, you know, he continued to push me, but obviously he was like, you know, you can only go as far as you want to go, but I would have, you know, moments where I would just show up. It was like, as if I blacked out, there was a, there was an indoor track meet we had in Arkansas. And, um, you know, on these indoor tracks, they have kind of these banked, uh, tracks and they're, they're re sometimes really difficult to run on, but they also are designed for folks to run really fast times. And it was like my junior year and we ended up winning the four by 800 meter relay. And I'd ran the best time that I ran since I'd been running that, that, that race. And like, it was like a breakthrough moment, um, and then, you know, I had some stall out moments after that. But that moment in particular, you know, my coaches were like, this is what we're talking about. We need to see this, <laughs> this sense of urgency. Um, and so it wasn't something I would really start to develop and cultivate till much later in my life. Hmm. I remember this, uh, this um, James Dyson anecdote. He, he was hmm. the guy that created the Dyson vacuum and all that billionaire. In the UK, and he said, talked about on an interview how he used to be a long distance runner, hmm. and he said if that's what taught him the key to success. He said, um, he said that there would be a inevitably there would be a point where everybody would get tired, and he had to be very intentional about training himself to accelerate at that point that he would look around and he knew everybody was tired. So he's like, when you're tired. Everybody else is tired. That's when you have to accelerate. And as hard as it is, 
if you can do that and train yourself to do that, then you will, then success is just around the corner. That's the running. I use that all the time when I'm, I'm speaking to creatives and I'm talking to other people, you know, running teaches you the most valuable lesson, in my opinion, you know, one being that you don't get anything out of it that you don't put into it. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I, I run half marathons and marathons to this day. My last marathon was, was last September and you don't get anything out of that that you don't put in. So if you don't go out and train and do your 20 mile run, when you know, you got 26 to do, um, you're not going to show up on race day and, and be able to do that without feeling a certain type of way. Like it requires that training. The other thing is that it's a mile at a time, right? And every mile, every step is going to uh, approach you with a different challenge. There's going to be a different environment, something different that you might not, might not expect. And then the other thing is that we're never a hundred percent in life. I don't, I, you know, I don't believe we're, we're able to be, there's so many different things that are competing for our attention and our energy. And so to that point, you have to learn how to operate when you're quote unquote tired. Um, and, and what does that mean to continue to 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 push through when you're not 100 percent? Because 100 uh, percent is ideal. And we rarely, right, rarely are able to achieve that. And so you got to be able to say, OK, I can not I can acknowledge that my body is not 100 percent, but I do believe I can continue to push on. How do I cultivate that? And that's what I, that's the stuff I learned through through running. I didn't learn that through anything else, which is also why I still run to this day, because it serves for me personally as a reminder. <laughs> it's funny. I was at the gym yesterday and I was on the treadmill because I try to get like, you know, 10,000 plus steps a day. And it's not always possible to do so <laughs> just walking around my neighborhood. Although this is probably one of the, I'm, I'm in Mexico City. So this is probably one of the most ideal places for walking. Yeah. But I also... I also have a commitment to posting on my social media a couple of times a day at least. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I hadn't posted yet. So I sometimes challenge myself when I'm preoccupied with something else. <laughs> let me post now. Like literally I'm going to create a post. I'm going to do the <laughs> caption and everything from the treadmill, not yeah. because I necessarily had to do it at that time, but I'm training myself. Just mm. kind of like that running anecdote. I'm training myself. If I can do it here when I'm, when there's a million other things going on around me and I'm a little bit, you know, winded and all this, then I can do it at any time, anywhere. You can do it anytime. Yeah. So it's kind of like Navy SEAL training for just staying committed to the things you say you want to do. Yeah. Cause there's no perfect, there's no perfect conditions. Perfect doesn't exist. It's either you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. We could find an excuse for either one, right? We can find a, a justification for why it makes sense to do it now. We can also find a justification for why it doesn't make sense to do it now. But, it, you know, when you think about like, am I doing the things that I need to do to get to where I'm going? It's going to require you to do things when you maybe not feel your best, or maybe you didn't get that much rest last night, or, or maybe like you said, you're at the gym and you're traveling and you're doing these things. But guess what? You know that if you do that, it gets you closer to to where you want to be. And so uh, it makes those decisions <laughs> a little bit easier if you can put it in that context. <laughs> All right. So going back to uh, younger Bima, mm -hmm. um, we we'll have another question. This is a little bit off topic, but not really. Oh, fine. Your name, your parents, were they mm -hmm. students of the Bhagavad Gita or how did they come up with Bima? <laughs> yeah. So. My, my full name is Brandon Michael Williams. Okay. And so the story is that, um, my, my mother was having an incredible career and she had come from this small city called Lake Charles that experiences a lot of poverty. And she had, you know, had, you know, six other siblings, um, um, seven other siblings, sorry, two of her siblings have passed away. And she was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta make something of myself. My mom has, she's got, she's got a, I call it expensive taste. <laughs> and so, um, she knew she wanted to go, um, create a life for herself where she could indulge in that, 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 um, expensive taste that she has. So she created this career. She became a supervisor at this chemical plant, um, called Honeywell. And she was about 34. And at that time, it was, you know, extremely like doctors are like, you know, it's too much of a risk to have a kid 
after you're 35. And so she was at the place where she was deciding, is she going to have a kid or is she just going to continue to focus on her career and, and just be married? And my mom decided, she said, well, I, I want both. So <laughs> I'm going to have a kid and his initials are going to be BMW. <laughs> And so my dad, as I said, his, um, he, he's a creative at heart and his creativity, um, came to be to like, um, uh, uh, antique cars, right. Uh, classic cars. He was part of a car club. And so he started to nickname me Bima after BMW. Uh, and so, um, he ended up passing away, um, a little over a decade and, um, as my way of honoring my father, I go by Bima. Interesting. That's a great story, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. It's a funny one too. <laughs> so you meet Caitlin. Yes. Um, I'm assuming you're still you're relatively young and your parents got divorced, but you decide to get married. Did people try to talk you out of that and say, Hey man, you know, you, you have all your whole life to get married, you know, just, you know, whatever, whatever you want to. You have all these aspirations. Talk a little bit about that, that decision. And, uh, and then you guys moving up to Boston. Yeah. You know, I, I would say, um, one excellent job on your research Two, Um, I would say that because of where we grew up, um, marriage was not, um, a question of if it was more of like a societal push of when mm. or do it now. And so the for Bible example, Bell. yes, yes. I mean, it was like, you know, you need to get married now, you know, from, from like a early, like early in our relationship, there were pressure from, there was pressure from so many different places of like, nope, yep. Y'all are together, get married. Right. Because it's also that, that Bible belt, that, that religious, um, standpoint of like, okay, so yeah, if this is, if y'all are going to be together, then yep. Sounds like you, you need to get married. And like, we met when I was 24, Caitlin was 21, she was finishing up college. And so that's what a lot of people did. Like they got married at like 21, 22. Um, we didn't end up getting married till, um, till three years later, um, after we had moved to, to Boston. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's interesting when you think about it now, because you're like, oh, you could have had a lot of these mental hangups about it because both of our parents ended up getting divorced. Um, and Honestly, it was around the same age for, for both of us. Like when she was nine, her parents got divorced. When I was nine, my parents got divorced. Um, but the thing that I think we both observed and, and why we ended up moving forward with it was one, because of just like Southern values and background. I think we were just already um, predisposed to making that decision. But I think the other thing was that we also had other folks in our lives that had been married for a very long time and poured into us um, as well. And so we felt that, you know, it was something that was possible. I think everybody who has been married, though, will say that um, you have no idea what you're getting into until you get into it. <laughs> <laughs> and especially when you're so young, because we all are going to grow, we're going to change, we're going to evolve. And, you know, some days you're like, man, who this person is different. And some days they're like, Ooh, you really annoying, <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, when I think about it, it's like, it's no different than what you go through with, with your friends. The only difference is you don't live with your friends. And so you, they can grow and you can all grow, but you also don't deal with that in like a day to day, every day, um, experience. And so, um, for us, it's been like, you know, the greatest, um, challenge of, of our lives. I'd say, you know, a relationship to me is more challenging than being an entrepreneur. Um, it's, it's way more of a, a dynamic, um, thing. So when I think about entrepreneurship, I'm like, oh yeah, yes, yeah, that's, that's easier. <laughs> it's like entrepreneurship, but you have to be concerned about what people are eating every day and how they slept last night and who's <laughs> Nord and <laughs> I mean, the emotional aspect of it, right? Like who's going to go to the bathroom first. And, you know. I mean, especially when we lived in Boston, we had like a, uh, like a 500 square foot apartment in one, one bathroom. Like you're living very intimate with each other. And I felt when, when COVID happened, I felt for a lot of people because like, they're now like in these shrunken environments and they can't leave. <laughs> hey, really quickly. If you like this content or if you don't like it, 
let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. So, uh, finally, I want to talk about your appearance. You, you, I'm watching you and there's this art behind you and you're very much on brand. Like you got the purple, you got the, the, the neutral tones, the browns, the creams, how deliberate of a decision has that been for you or did it, has it just developed organically that you sit down and do a Pinterest board about what I want <laughs> my, my appearance, my aesthetic to be the, with the purple beanie and, and the whole, cause you have that in all your posts and in your interviews. So talk a little bit about that court capsule wardrobe. Yeah. So the, I would say the idea behind it was, was deliberate. How it, happened was more organic, but the idea behind it was deliberate. And what I, what I recognized was that we're in a competitive world. And, and what I recognize in this world is that typically, especially in my space, folks change constantly, constantly changing appearances, what they wear, how they do it. And, and I realized that in a sea of competition, Waldo always stands out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Waldo is always going to stand out. I like and that. so I, I, it also speaks to my introvert nature, right? I can, how can I draw the attention versus like me having to go out and, and do it the opposite way. And so, um, I also thought about it from a logo standpoint, right? Every brand has a logo, has an identity to it. And I said, a personal brand should have that as well, should work for, for a personal brand. And so a part of it is also how I could have the ability to storytell too. So Purple was always an important color to me for where I came from. I went, I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, LSU. I went to LSU. Purple was a big color there. I also grew up and spent a lot of time in New Orleans. Purple's a big color there, Mardi Gras, um, and different, different schools and such. And so it means so much to my community. And so when I left home and then I then years later started Clayma, I wanted to make sure that the people from where I'm from knew that they were being represented um, by a citizen of their community. The other thing was that um, color has been divisive in ways. We look at red and blue in political sense, especially today, we are more divided than we've ever been. When we think about the streets, we think about gangs, red and blue, we're more divided than we've ever been. And I, was, I always wanted to feel like I could figure out how to bring folks together. So red and blue, purple, purple. that's really the story behind why purple is so important to me. The brown, is also a statement. I, um, when I was working in corporate environments, um, I would always see that senior leadership would have black tops and bottoms and they would have white shoes. And it would always typically be um, folks that didn't look like me. And a lot of times it was white males. And, and I said, okay, bet. I'm wearing brown. This is my protest against this. I'm not falling into this archetype. I'm going to wear brown. I'm going to wear cream shoes, slightly just off from, from what they do. And then where I'm from, we always say, um, when you started at the bottom and you've come from nothing, um, you know, our phrase from where I'm from is you got it out the mud. And so brown to me is also the reminder of that. I came from so far, um, far behind or however you want to think about it to get to, to where I am today, it keeps me humble. And, and so now that I have this, this ensemble and I'm literally dressed in the reminder of who I am, I can't go into a single room and fake the funk. I got to be who I am. Um, when I'm in those rooms, I have to be honest. I have to be transparent because I'm not just here representing me. I'm here representing folks from my community and folks from the creative community. Um, and this just helps me. It also helps me feel comfortable in my own skin. Like even when I'm in these other rooms and, and folks may not be comfortable with themselves, they're like, so you wear this everywhere. And I'm like, everywhere, seven of seven. How Laundry many, day is easy for me. <laughs> if I look in your closet, would I just see a bunch of brown hoodies? Yeah. And yeah, you got brown t-shirts, brown hoodies, brown crew necks, uh, brown fleece. Shout out to my friend said. <laughs> <laughs> brown suit. <laughs> so your it wife is, will go out and then come back home with some brown shit saying, Hey, <laughs> put that down. I mean, my, my workout, my running outfit is brown. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Hey man, you post some amazing content on marketing and, um, and I, I'm, I'm really curious about your creative process. If you could just kind of walk us through, like, I see you're sitting in the place where you normally shoot your content. Is there a camera yes. in front of you or is it a three camera setup? Yeah. So it's a one camera setup in front of me. And I also use a, um, uh, what's it called? What's it called? Oh, a, a teleprompter with the iPad. So I can have notes when I'm recording. Mm -hmm. um, so you write, you a, script it out yourself. Yeah. So I'll, I'll write it out myself. And um, I, it's more so for just a comfort part. Yeah, sure. But I, I rarely do I stick to it. <laughs> it's just like, it's there. And then I'm like, okay, I'm just going to ad lib this part. Um, but it's, you know, it's there so I can just collect my thoughts because I'm I also am a over analytical type. And so mm -hmm. when I find that I don't have a little bit of that there, um, I overthink it and I trip over my words. So sure. sometimes just having it there and then so I can uh, riff in my own way. There's a confidence monitor I have here so I can like see what I look like on camera. Um, otherwise, I'm just recording and not knowing. I got this soft light here to the left of me and I use like this Zoom H6 thing. And then I also work out of here. And so like I have my, um, my screen um, here too for when I do, um, uh, when I'm just working on consulting or, or marketing stuff. Uh, and then from a creation standpoint, I create over days. Um, and so what I mean is like, I'll, there's a day like Monday, especially I just take in a lot of insights because so much stuff comes in on Mondays. And so I'll just take in a lot of information. And then from there, I'll start creating ideas the next day. And then from there, and I'm working on multiple at once. And so they'll have buckets for them. And then I'll start writing them. And then the next day I'll start editing them. And then when I feel good about it is when I'll, I'll record typically. And so I try to stretch mine out. Um, and then I typically either record like early morning, like five, 6 a.m. Um, or, 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 or late at night, just cause I got so much stuff going on. I wish, I wish I had a, a better like flow, but I don't at this point. <laughs> are you, are you a one man show when you're recording? This is yeah. You, yeah. You know, just for social content. It's just, just me creating, writing, editing, posting. Um, it's just me. So I, when 2020, I was posting a video a day and I didn't, it wasn't a kind of sophisticated studio like you have set up, but I used to have a teleprompter and just ask for confidence, like you said, but I would go off script a lot. I would sit down and write the video. It would take me about two, two and a half hours a day to get the video mm -hmm. out with titles mm -hmm. and all that stuff, captions. Yeah. yeah. And, but alas, I, I would sometimes record it. No shit. 30 times just to get it, to get it the way I wanted it to be. Yeah. Cause I was just, I had that standard for myself. How many, yeah. what, what about you? What's your, are you a stickler for like, it's got to look a certain way or are you kind of like, I'll just, I'll just deal with it in editing later. I, I believe you got to get it right in the shot to save yourself the pain in the edit. And so I, I'm very much like how, making sure I get it right up front. I record as many times as I need to, till it feels right. I just, you know, and sometimes that's, that could be a painful morning. <laughs> it could be a painful morning. And you're just like this, I just spent this much time doing this. And so that's why I do try to do a lot before I sit down to record. I try to make sure I have as much as baked as possible. Cause I know if I don't, if I'm sitting down and I'm still editing, it's going to be a very long morning. And, uh, that's not what I, that's what I don't want. So, um, by the time I sit down, you know, I'm at a place now where I'm like one or two takes now mm -hmm. where I'm, I'm, I'm getting it to, to where I want it to be. Um, and it's, it's quicker just because like, I know kind of what it is. I know how, um, my formula for, for that is, um, and, and I just try to try to take it easy. The hardest part is the, the part that still takes more time is the edit. Cause I'm bringing in like photos into it and B-roll out and sections, that. you know, you do that yourself. So, yeah. Yeah. I do, do all the B-roll. Um, do you edit on your um, phone or you edit on a, on computer or both? So uh, friends of mine want me to use premiere. I'm using mm -hmm. premiere rush. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're like, you could do all these things. And I was like, yeah, it's just like, I just need the simple one. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'll go through and I'll chop out the sections and I'll add the, the B-roll and then I'll use, um, uh, I still like using um, captions for um, like some of the other edits, 
but I also recognize I'm like I could just like use Premiere and do all of the like things in one place, but I'm just being a hard I'm being hard headed. <laughs> do you do you have a sense of what which ones are gonna get the most traction, or does it kind of surprise you when it happens? Some surprise me, but there are ones that I always know are gonna go. Like if there's any time Pharrell's doing something, it's gonna go. Tyler's doing something, it's gonna go. Um, um, if there's anything happening at the intersection of culture that folks are talking about, like if I did a video today um, talking about the the J Cole Kendrick thing, it would go um, because it's it's a it's of conversation right now. The ones that surprise me are what I call kind of like middle of the funnel for me, which is just like helpful information occasionally, um, which is right. It's not like a popular pop culture topic. But it's 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 more so like, hey, like, did you know if you pin these three posts, it'll make it easier for somebody to identify what it is that you're trying to solve, what it is that you do and how they might be part of that or benefit from it. Um, Occasionally, something might happen and all of a sudden that video might go from 20,000 views to like 50,000 views and then be on the explore page. And I don't know how or what the algorithm is doing, but occasionally that will happen. But for the most part, I'm pretty clear on what's going to go for me, um, just just based on what I know my audience is constantly talking to me about. I'm like, okay, this is this is what they're going to respond to. Um, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, I like, I spend a lot of time talking about different types of marketing approaches, but right now we're in that era of outrage. <laughs> and anytime someone does anything outrageous, it's just going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, man. So for my audience who wants to, uh, who's heard this and they're inspired and they want to, they want to get into that Bima Williams ecosystem. What are some of what, some of the ways that you recommend them starting down the rabbit hole? Is there one interview that you, you recommend they check out? Is there, I know you have an amazing newsletter. They should sign up for that, but just kind of give us the step-by-step so that we can get the biggest bang for the buck moving into your world. Yeah. So uh, first, first thing I would tell them is to check out the interview with Tyler Creator. Um, we did two, but Classic. I think the the first yeah. one is like the one. The first one uh, was the NFT one, right? Yes. The first one was the NFT one. <laughs> and that was just a, a really incredible conversation. So I would say start with that one. Um, and then next, I would say the newsletter. If you're a freelance creative and you're trying to figure out how to build your own world and create something sustainable. It is specifically tailored to that. I don't spam you. The reads are five minutes. They're Monday, 4 a.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time. And so those are always there. And then um, Instagram, um, particularly the reels, is where I try to break down cultural marketing moments and distill them into ways that you could tangibly understand. And then I always provide you with this four step. Um, just framework of a reminder of like, these are the things that you need to focus on as like a new or even existing experience creative. Don't forget these things because this is what helps you continue to unlock and move forward. So those would be the three areas um, that I would say. And that's for anybody with a brand or even if it's a personal brand yes. who wants to uh, scale that or, or just just come across more authentically. Absolutely. Absolutely. Beautiful, man. Well, thank you so much, man. That was awesome. Um, it was you know, exceeded all expectations and, and <laughs> aspiration. And uh, thank you for in- inviting me to the platform. I, um, you know, it's, I, I, I think you're super intentional about, about your work. And obviously I keep track of like who you're bringing on, on your platform. Um, and so thank you for allowing me to come contribute to what you're building and how you continue to pour in the people. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much. I look forward to connecting with you in person one of these days. Are you, so you're yes. mainly in Portland, right? I'm mainly in Portland, uh, but now I know you're, I was in, um, two years ago, we did New Year's in Mexico City and we're really? like, we're coming back because um, it was such a remarkable experience. Just yeah. the city and the culture is so big. We didn't get to touch everything. <laughs> and so we're, we're absolutely like, we got to get back. Let's give Caitlin a shout out too. Um, the yes. ice cream. Tell yes. So um, my partner, Caitlin, my wife started making ice cream 10 years ago. She started making it in Boston. It's plant-based ice cream. The thing that she does different is, you know, she's a Southern, she's a Southern gal at heart. And uh, she was like, I'm making this for folks that have lactose issues, but it's still ice cream. It's a dessert. 
she's like, it's going to be creamy. It's going to have sugar in it. It's going to have great flavors. And so she also brings in a lot of nostalgic flavors. Um, this week, they're bringing back the Choco Taco, um, their version of it, where it's plant-based and gluten-free, but it's so creamy. Like a lot of folks come in the shop who aren't plant-based and they don't even realize it's plant-based ice cream. So um, she just ce celebrated the second anniversary of her first shop um, in Portland. And now she's under construction for her second location on the west side of Portland. So if you, you come visit the area, she's got a shop on North Mississippi. And by the summertime, she'll have one on Northwest 23rd called Kate's Ice Cream. Is she a natural marketer or do you help each other or do you guys have, <laughs> you guys have a rule like we don't give each other business advice because, you yeah. know, it could go yeah. south quickly? Um, Caitlin is, um, her business and operational acumen, I would say are her, her strong suit. Um, she runs a, a business better than, um, so, so many people. She just, um, her, her ice cream shop is in business is in the top percent of, of profitable ice cream businesses, um, in the country. And where I come in is I, I support from just marketing standpoint. She'll ask me brand and marketing advice, and that's where I share. And then she also does the same for me. There's also ideas that she comes up with that I implement, but also she comes in with the, the business acumen of she's like, no, nah, you don't need to spend money on that yet. Nope, don't do that yet. <laughs> you know, like she keeps me um, keeps me in check because I lean, I do lean more on the creative side and I, I get I can get caught up in like, I don't want to do this big campaign and I want to, you know, shoot it with these cameras. And she's like, but didn't you just do that video with, with the cameras you got and got 400,000? Why are we going, why are we going to spend money on this? <laughs> she keeps me honest. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, I'm going to yeah. uh, end with this one quote that you, I've heard you say, which is the world doesn't want you to be perfect. The world wants you to be unique. And, mm. uh, and you've definitely embodied that in your work and in your, in your contribution to uh, marketing. So thank you very much for that. Wow. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, the time. This has been, this has been great. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.